I'm going to start a little bit about talking about the global context. What's changing in development? When the MDGs was, were, were uh, developed, we weren't really thinking very much around climate change and the really big changes that are going to happen, and we are all faced with that. We also know that we're moving towards a world in which by 2050 there are going to be 9 billion people and possibly even up to 11 billion. So we've got a big challenge on population. You know, in terms of the global context, we also have an economic downturn in many parts of the world. We know in the UK there are increasing pressures on public resources. We also know that in terms of aid flows worldwide, actually, although many governments have pledged, we are likely to see quite a lot of pressure on aid flows. And just very briefly, we also know quite a lot more about the way in which poverty is changing <coughs> worldwide. If you look at absolute numbers of poor over the next period, more of those poor people are actually in the middle-income countries, strangely. But if you look at the proportion of poor people, of course, there are much higher levels of proportion in the population in Africa. OK, what's been the UK government's response? We had an election a year ago, and I think all of you know very well the biggest priority for the current government is dealing with the budget deficit. And we saw the budget earlier this week. A major part of the work, and what government is emphasizing, is the need for much more efficient public services a much stronger commercial ethos in the way government works. So in terms of contracts, thinking much more about, you know, what is the value for money here, what are we getting in return, and so on. The government and the Prime Minister particularly has emphasized also that what his vision is very much about a big society, not big government. And it doesn't just mean reducing government, but it means a different kind of government and, in, and encouraging people to do the kinds of things many of you already are doing. Within all of that, we also know that the government has committed to meet, you know, DFID and the UK aid was the one of two depart, government departments which was protected. We've had three major reviews which have been launched in the past year. The bilateral aid review, the multilateral aid review, and next week will be launched what's called the HER, which is the Humanitarian and Emergency Response Review. <coughs> Andrew Mitchell, who's the Secretary of State, has emphasized, I think, his, his clear, in every speech he makes, and I think most of you know this, he has constantly emphasized tangible results. He wants to see measurable results. He wants to see outcomes and impacts. He's emphasized the value for money. And the final thing that has also been set up is an independent commission on aid impact. A little bit very quickly on why we work with civil society. We have a saying within the department, we use, uh, I think it's the Heineken advert, Heineken reaches the parts that others don't reach. Second thing is what we know about civil society. You can respond quickly and flexibly to humanitarian relief. And often civil society is better at supporting particular groups of poor people. But what we find in this new context is actually, if you look at the evidence, there's very limited evidence of civil society being any better than governments, the UN system, or anybody else at enabling work with the chronically poor. There's actually very limited assist uh, evidence of civil society organizations consistently performing better than other types of aid. Okay, we have five broad objectives for our work with civil society. The first is around delivering goods and services, particularly in poor, in fragile countries, in states where there's very, very little government service. A second uh, uh, objective, which is around both em empowering citizens to be more effective in holding governments to account, but also to do things for themselves. And actually, this is quite an important area of work that is really worth thinking about. What can you not only enable people to hold their governments to account, but what can you enable citizens' groups to do for themselves? The third is around what we know is that governments alone can never deal with international development. Governments and private sector can't. You always are going to need a strong civil society, a robust civil society. And we need to build and maintain that space for civil society. Next thing around influencing policies at national, regional, international levels, especially on aid effectiveness. 
And the final thing is around building support for development. I mean, there's a whole range of ways in which DFID supports civil society. The major changes very quickly, I think the first is the Global Poverty Action Fund, the launch of that. We are just about, we have a management board, there are two windows of that fund, an innovation fund, which is small amounts of funding, quick disbursement, etc., for really innovative work. And we have larger grants for imp what are called impact grants, and that fund late in, in April, May, you'll see the first round of applications having gone through and been assessed and the results of that. The uh, Secretary of State has also said we're in the last round of program partnership arrangements, which are these unrestricted funds, which are for the next three years. As part of our new funding arrangements, we have, for the first time, introduced a 40% uh, maximum of organizational income that DFID can provide through our funding streams. And that is partly to encourage organizations to try and be more, to diversify funding sources and to be more self-sufficient. We also have, through this bilateral aid review, a new set of focal countries. There are 27 focal countries where DFID will be working. But for our civil society funds, we support work in what's the human development indexes, bottom 50 countries. And gradually, we're moving towards a situation where we're moving towards performance-based funds. So if an organization gets a grant and performs well, we're more likely to provide further support for it. And we're asking all organizations, all civil society organizations also, to sign up to a transparency guarantee. So if you receive funds from us, we would like you both to publicize that in the UK through your websites and so on, but also in the countries where you work. With diaspora groups, and it's fantastic the range of diaspora groups we have here. Look, I, I mentioned the, the importance of remittances, and I think you all know that, and it's absolutely critical. Re remittances are bigger than aid flows globally. So it really matters, but often what, how they're used and where they're being utilized. But often remittances aren't always targeted at the poorest people. Our work through, with diaspora groups, as I said, is supported through a number of ways. Common Ground Initiative, the Global Poverty Action Fund, volunteering, and there's also work which is being supported indirectly through UK government, which has made money available to the Scottish government to be able to use for aid and development. A big question which has come up in a lot of workshops with civil society is, you know, what, what do you mean by results and value for money? And when we talk about value for money, it doesn't just mean doing the cheapest things. We don't mind providing more money as long as there's real value being added. In terms of civil society organizations being effective, I've just listed out a few th key things that we look for. The first is having a clear vision and what we call a theory of change. So if you provide money and you're trying to relieve, let's say, deal with hunger in a country or health, improve health services, we want to know what happens to your, the money that's given to you, how it, does that translate into the outcomes that you want to see? The issues around results, we want those to be measurable. We know not that development isn't linear, that not everything can be measured, but we do think that we in the international development community can get better at measuring things. Organization, no one organization can do any of the things that we all want to achieve, which is a fairer world, more equitable world, a better world. And so it's about how do you partner with others? What kind of alliances do you build? Being well governed and having clear organizational systems, financial management, human resources, skills and development and so on. We also want to encourage organizations to diversify their sources of income and really maximize value. What is it that you can do that other organizations can't do? And a strong commitment to transparency, learning, and improved practice. And I'm passionate about investing in people and leadership. I was in Sierra Leone last week and saw some really, two weeks ago, and saw some really brilliant young leaders there talking about what they're doing in their school and community. And we went to one of the areas just outside Freetown, and we saw some of the work that a group are doing around education and so on. The challenge is there. We can all make a difference, but it's about how we work together and really being using the funds, the resources we have effectively.